Hey everyone, I am Mike Lowe and we are in NBA 2K23 on NextGen. And in this video, we're gonna be talking about how to set up an expansion team. We're gonna be going through the entire off season, step by step here and show you my approach, including hiring staff, including setting up and getting a realistic draft experience. And then we will also be jumping in and talking about uh, the strategies of free agency for an expansion team. So there's a lot to cover. We're gonna get into all of it and I will share with you my approach. There's another video on the channel that talks about my top 10 tips for setting up expansion, and that video will work really well with this video. Without further ado, let's get into it. So really the first thing you wanna start with is where and I guess when you'd wanna start your expansion experience. And I say experience because it's more than just building your team. Of course, you could start with one of these previous eras, uh, and I get a lot of questions on the eras. Where can I find this? How did you get to this? There's no secret other than you have to be on next gen. New eras, uh, these eras, I should say, are only part of the next gen experience for either Xbox or PlayStation. So um, it's also not on PC. Um, so most of you will probably be starting in the modern era. And that's even where I'm starting, even with a next gen system. Um, so that'd be kind of the first thing you want to think about. But more importantly, is kind of the where in that experience you'd want to start. And what I mean by that is actually here on this next screen, which is gonna be allowing you to choose where you start from, right? So you could do regular season, which would kind of start you at the start of the current NBA season. You could back that up a little bit and start in the off season, and that would allow you to redo the most recent off season, or you could start with today. Now, I don't even know if it'll let you do expansion teams regular season because like they wouldn't come in until the next season. So right away, you can say that's not an option. Your options are to either start, as I said, off season, redo the entire draft. And, and that's realistic to a standpoint where it's set up realistically. That's how an expansion team would come into the league. The unrealistic part is that you're kind of undoing very recent history the 2022 draft and so on. So you just wanna be uh, cognizant of that. Where I started mine is with the today feature. So let's take a look and see how that's playing out. So starting with that start today option, it starts you, not surprisingly, today, which in my case was kind of late January. And so I'm picking up here in the NBA season right around January 25th. And what this is gonna do is it's gonna one, get me to the off season a little bit quicker, but also get me there a little bit more realistically. Um, there's probably not gonna be like massive changes to the NBA here as we kind of simulate through this last, you know, month and a half, two months or whatever. Uh, mostly because, uh, you know, we have player stats are updated, standings are updated. You're not gonna see the NBA get, its, uh, get kind of flipped over on its head, uh, so to speak. So I like to use this start today option, especially if you're late in the season, or even better, if you're at maybe the end of the season, which is a really fun time to start a expansion team setup. And then from that starting point, I just simulate the rest of the season. But for me, I like to keep an eye on what's happening around the league, whether it's standing, statistics, award winners, playoffs, things like that. And uh, here we have the Celtics again winning, uh, this time over the Lakers in a sweep. And then this is a really good place to not only kind of save a backup because ultimately as you get into doing your uh, expansion team setup, you may have some changes. You may uh, regret some mistakes you make, say in like the new division alignment. So it's always nice to keep a backup here at the end of the year. It's also um, not necessarily the last time, but it's kind of the last time uh, that I really would think about maybe getting your expansion team set up. In this case, I'm using Las Vegas and Seattle. Uh, so I have those kind of set and ready to go. And then the league will eventually vote on that. You can, of course, veto it because most of the time, especially in that kind of first off season, they are probably going to reject it, even though there is a majority. Uh, they will reject that uh, because I think it's like a 75 percent threshold or something you need in order for uh, uh, a measure to pass there. So but nonetheless, you have that all set up. And again, you can always override that. So let's kind of move forward now and take a look at advancing to the off season and all that's there that I like to focus on to get things set up for the expansion team. Now, I've already gone through a lot of these kind of simple first items, such as player retirements and staff retirements and so on. But this is, again, an area where I encourage you to slow down and just sort of take it in. Look and see how your league progressed by the way, I get asked this a lot too. Um, I don't care about matching real life. So uh, to me, when I start a 
a dynasty or an online league or whatever it is I'm setting up in my NBA in this case, I am taking over from that point. It's uh, the reality changes for me. I'm not looking to mirror real life. If I want to just follow real life, I'll watch real life. And so to me, I am just taking it all in. So I'm looking through the retirements, for instance. Uh, and again, they're not going to match up perfectly to real life. That's fine because this is my NBA, quote unquote, right? So uh, same thing. I'll look at staff retirements and it's just a, a way to kind of just keep me in the know of what's happening around the league. So again, these are really, really straightforward things. These first three or four items, uh, Camarillo, Camarillo Anthony, I should say, getting a lot of uh, respect here. Um, it, it's a bit of a bummer that the game kind of uh, speeds up the, uh, the Hall of Fame inductions and so on. It'd be cool if they kind of hid those for five years or whatever it is in the NBA. But still, those are there. Really, the first important thing here are the league meetings. And these are, first off, they're completely customizable. So if you wanted to, and I've already progressed through, so they're probably locked for me. But you could go through, you could adjust these things, you could replace the different things, uh, you could uh, overrule something if you wanted. In this case, the only thing I've done is I overruled to add the expansion teams. This is very important. Your expansion teams won't show up if you don't do this, right? So make sure if it doesn't win by uh, kind of voting on the measure, make sure that you overrule that and get that approved. And then from there, you're gonna move on to a couple other things. And this is really kind of where it starts, right? Setting up your league alignment and so on. Um, so let's talk a little bit about more, uh, some of the kind of heavy hitting items here as we work towards getting into uh, the expansion draft, the NBA draft, and so on. And I'll talk all about, too, kind of my approach to building an expansion team. So the first kind of heavy hitting item on this list is going to be your league realignment. And of course, you have freedom to do whatever you want with this. And I will show you my alignment here in a second. It's a little tricky, though, if you keep all the teams in the uh, you know United States, Canada, Mexico, that sort of setup, because there's just so much more uh, of a dense population on the East Coast of the United States, for instance. This is why we have a lot more teams there. So it's actually pretty easy to make an Eastern Conference. It gets a little tricky setting up the Western Conference properly because just cities are a little bit smaller. They're certainly more spread out uh, and it makes kind of a, a, a geographical alignment a little challenging when you look at the West, when you look at the, the South, the Southwest, that sort of thing. Here's what I came up with. We went with four divisions. There's gonna be eight teams in each division. And what's neat is you'll notice that the Northwest Division is now called the Midwest Division. Now, there's no like magic to this or anything. I wasn't able to go in and like edit the file. Um, this just happened. And the way this happened is by moving all of the teams out of the Southwest, which you see would have seen in the bottom on left here in that open area. And then over here in the Southeast, when I removed all of the teams from those divisions, it ended up renaming the Northwest Division to the Midwest. So it's kind of like retrofitting to a previous NBA because there used to be a Midwest Division in the NBA, but it's really nice because it fits much, much better. It'd be really weird if Dallas or New Orleans was in a division called the Northwest, right? So uh, is Midwest ideal? I mean, not exactly, because you almost think like Midwest and Central are, are really similar, but the way it works out for the Western Conference, because we can't edit these on PlayStation, uh, this is really the best we're going to get. And I just like to kind of emphasize maybe the West in Midwest, right? So um, you can see the teams we have set up here, Utah, Dallas, Denver, New Orleans, Houston, San Antonio, Oklahoma, and Minnesota. And then down in the Pacific, Clippers, Kings, Lakers, Suns, Trailblazers, Warriors, and then the two expansion teams, in this case, Seattle and Las Vegas. It's not ideal having both expansion teams, not only in the same conference, but even in the same division, but I'm going for kind of longevity here. It's gonna be worth it in the long run, even though these teams will probably get some extra wins this year uh, that could maybe, you know, kind of beef up their, uh, I guess, playoff resume. Uh, but nonetheless, that's just how it kind of worked out. In the East, we have the Atlantic Division, uh, which really kind of extends the entire uh, coastline, right? All the way from, you know, somewhere like Boston down to Miami. Uh, but there's Philadelphia, Charlotte, the Knicks, Orlando, Brooklyn, the Wizards. And then in the Central Division, this, this, this division lined up pretty well. Toronto, Detroit, Indianapolis, Atlanta, Memphis, Cleveland, Chicago, and Milwaukee. Probably like the odd team out is, is really Minnesota. You could have really made an argument that they could have fit into the Central Division as well. But um, it, if you look at kind of a map of where the NBA teams are, 
it's odd, as I mentioned. And so Minnesota is kind of that odd team out, even though they're pretty close to Milwaukee. Someone had to be in the Western Conference as that 16th team, and it was Minnesota for me. But let me know what you come up with. If you use some different alignments, maybe you stuck with three divisions. I really wish that NBA 2K would let us go to four divisions. But rest assured, if you go to 36 teams, three divisions will work really, really well because you can end up with uh, an even number of teams there in each division still. It just gets a little weird when you kind of go beyond 30 up until you get to 36 when it's a little bit more balanced. But yeah, let me know what you came up with for your alignment. So next up, we have the draft lottery and your expansion teams don't participate in the draft lottery this first season. And that's how it's always gone historically in the NBA, as far as I know. Uh, they let kind of the first top four teams sort of, uh, you know, duke it out, so to speak, for that top pick. And then the expansion teams, if you're using two, come in at picks five and six. Uh, and that's what we're going to see here. Uh, in the future, your team will be eligible for the draft lottery, just like any other team that does not make the playoffs. So uh, that's just how it goes for this first year. But very similar to how I keep an eye on the standings and the statistics and award winners, I like to immerse myself in the draft lottery. So it's something I'll go through and just kind of watch. I've already gone through this one. And for me, I'm pretty excited because my hometown Pistons end up getting the number one pick. Most likely they will have Victor Wembayama. That's, of course, something that Piston fans are hoping for in real life. Uh, maybe pair him up with another uh, uh, Killian Hayes, another player that played in France and so on. So pretty cool storyline there that's developing in my particular season. So um, again, draft lottery, I encourage you to watch it, but rest assured you will be picking after those first top four teams pick. Um, but then uh, you can see there, right? Sonics five, Hustlers six, um, but you will eventually be eligible for an even higher spot in the future. So now we're into the staff signing phase and what you're seeing here is um, just some sped up video of me going through this process. Truthfully, this is probably the area of my MBA that needs improvement the most, in my opinion. Um, it's pretty boring. It's really tedious and it's just not organized as well as a lot of the other parts of the game. There's a lot of depth there. It's really, really intuitive. I mean, the fact that you can hire all of these different positions, whether it's a CFO or a sports psychologist and things like that. It's really, really cool. Uh, but it's just, it's really weird. Like, I don't know why I even have the option to hire a CFO uh, or a person who's had experience, quote unquote, as a CFO in uh, to a position like sports psychologist or something like that. Like it should filter it a little bit more. It's kind of weird. In some areas it makes sense. Like I may want to promote a assistant coach from another team to be a head coach. That's a very logical move that happens all the time in sports. Um, but there's just a lot of different things here that could be cleaned up. Uh, I mean, even the fact of like some of these fake coaches like this Michael Stoffer, uh, who's in like every game. And I think he's actually one of the developers of the game. So it's, it's kind of cool. He's there. But like, let me take that out. I don't want him in there. I don't want another team signing him. He's just way too good of a coach. Um, and it's not to say everything's bad. I love the badging system. I, the artwork is phenomenal. Like these players or I just say the coaches. I mean, there's a lot of variety. They look really, really well done. Um, I mean, this is far and away, in my opinion, the best sports game for uh, kind of coming up with like custom headshots, uh, especially the fictionalized ones. They just look terrific. Um, and again, not always. I know there's a lot of people who complain about the uh, the drafted players and whatnot, but the, 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 I'm talking about the coaches in particular. Not to mention you actually have females in there, which is super cool. So they've done a really, really nice job with all of that. So anyway, what am I looking for here? I mean, I'm looking to fill a ton of positions. As far as head coach, I do try to create some parameters, which you're seeing here. Uh, I am looking at either a head coach or an assistant coach only. Like I'm not going to hire a, a scout or a post D coach or something like that in the head coach position. And so I try to do that really with all of the different positions. Um, just try to find things that are realistic. I also, at least for head coach, I try to find someone who actually has real life uh, head coaching ex or some sort of coaching experience. So I try not to hire one of the fictional coaches, for instance, at least for head coach. But again, your mileage will vary, as they say. Uh, you can really do what you want here. But this area was tedious. I sped it up a little bit because this it's my least favorite spot. But we did hire 17 coaches and we're ready to move on. Okay, so here is how my staff actually panned out. We filled all 17 of our spots and I try to set up a balance that seems realistic. Um, meaning I don't hire like 500 scouts, for instance. You really don't need that. I mean, there's two rounds in the draft. Um, typically, you have two picks in the draft. And so, um, you know, you'll, you'll see when I show you my uh, setup for 
scouting that I just kind of keep it uh, kind of like a reasonable level. But I do hire an assistant GM. I hire a CFO. And from coaching, again, it's just kind of a mix. I mean, I always like to hire kind of a head coach first here. We got Kenny Atkinson, so assistant coach of the, of the Warriors there, kind of an in-division uh, acquisition there. Um, definitely always hire an assistant coach. And then from there, it's really just kind of how you want to use sort of these secondary coaches, uh, however you see fit. Because we're an expansion team and I really don't know what we have exactly, I kind of went with more generic. Obviously, we're always going to be shooting. Obviously, we're going to need play, to play post D and perimeter D. Um, and we're going to have guards, obviously, and wings. But um, because I don't know exactly what we're going to have just yet, based on the expansion draft and then the amateur draft, uh, left these kind of open for at least this year. So we'll kind of see how it goes. And then I try to mix up mixing in some three and four year deals so that you don't have like complete turnover. Um, and that's really up to you. It's going to cost you a little bit more to get a three year deal to get someone to agree. Um, but I pretty much got all of my top targets. I did not get my my top coach. Uh, I think Wilkes, the, was he the assistant coach or from Oklahoma City? was our first choice, but they would not let him go. I went up to as high as like six million a year and they just would not budge. Um, they kind of blocked that hiring. So, which is something you'll see if you see blocked, it's almost like restricted free agency. And I don't know if that's necessarily how real life is in the NBA, uh, but that seems to have been what had happened. Um, I believe it happened with Atkinson's where they blocked him once, but then after that, they just let him go uh, when I upped it. So. That's what our coaching staff looks like. Now, scouting, again, I keep it kind of bare bones because it's not really necessary to build out this whole unit, in my opinion. Um, I get just guys who I think have good badges, maybe some good potential, um, and then really just kind of let them go. One foreign scout seems to be enough. Domestic scout with a head scout. I don't exactly know how this all kind of like interacts with each other uh, during scouting, but I've never had an issue. I mean, usually, if anything, it's it's too easy. I, I get too much information. So I like to kind of keep this, uh, which seems reasonable. Head scout, which I think you have to have. Domestic scout, foreign scout. Sports medicine, kind of like the coaching staff, you need a team doctor. After that, it's really just kind of how you want to um, break it down. Um, I definitely like to get a stamina trainer because it seems like stamina is always tough. My players are always getting pretty tired. Um, strength training, again, that's going to really be helpful for an expansion team, especially uh, as you're developing young players. That's going to help with the vertical strength, that kind of thing. Uh, and again, any of these are going to be important, but a lot of these coaches or uh, I guess uh, medical staff folks, they have badges that can kind of fill in for these at least. Now, I don't think that's as good, like having a stamina trainer, for instance, with maybe like a sports science badge probably isn't as effective as actually having a person in that sports science slot, but it's better than nothing. And I use those badges a lot of times as kind of tiebreakers. With us being an expansion team, I don't mind going for potential in a lot of these places. One area that I don't want to focus too much on potential, um, I want guys who are good right away, are your scouts, right? So these are uh, scouts here that I saw are, are pretty good. It just so happens that Burt Kelly, for instance, also has good potential. But these guys can help me right now with their analytics. They can help me right now with their badges. We can't be missing as an expansion team here in these first few years as we build out this staff. So um, that's what we're doing here. Again, CFO, I don't really want someone who's developing. I need them to start managing money well right away. Um, and you can always just press R3 uh, on PS5 at least, and you can um, you know see the different badges. You can kind of flip through and see what these things mean. So pay attention to these. They do seem to be pretty impactful. It's also a nice way just to kind of narrow down the search because the, the staff uh, hiring phase, it's probably the least interesting and, and very cumbersome aspect of NBA 2K. If, if there's an area in their offseason setup that I really hope to see them improve, it is staff signing to make it a little bit more streamlined um, where I can't just hire like a... Uh, uh, a sports psychologist as my head coach, for instance. I mean, it just kind of streamline it a little bit more. But overall, once you get through that, it starts to get a lot more interesting. Um, from there, we're going to be moving on to the combines, which will be really important here as we build our expansion team. Now, the reason why the combines and even your pre-draft workouts are really important as an expansion team is typically, if, if you're doing it like me, where you did the start today, you're not getting much information. Now, these are completely empty, uh, but rest assured, I have gone through them and I've just kind of taken some mental notes of some players that I like. Um, we did invite some players uh, kind of based off of those notes, but you'll notice like I didn't invite Wembayama, for instance. I have the fifth pick. He's not falling to five, and if he does, I'll pick him. I don't need to scout him further. So I kind of scouted players that would be sort of around 
uh, you know, kind of around where my pick would be. And then also uh, really around kind of like where our second round pick would be, right? So uh, you're going to see a lot of players like some of these stash players that maybe we grab with our, our second round pick. Um, and so really we're just trying to kind of create like a bell curve where I'm, I'm very heavy around the fifth pick in the draft uh, as far as scouting. And then we're also very heavy around, say, like that 37th pick or so, because uh, that's where our second round pick is going to fall. And there's always the chance we trade down and things like that. And we just have to see how the draft unfolds see how the expansion draft unfolds but uh this was kind of the strategy i went with so you don't have to just pick the the top you know 13 players or however many they let you uh bring into this team workout you can strategize because it's the only information i'm gonna get right now um because of uh how this worked most of these other players i don't even get these sort of ratings right um, they're just question marks at this point. And so it's really, really important. You don't need to waste scouting on Wembayama if you don't have the first, maybe second pick. And so you can use this in other areas because you're going to get some good information, um, even just kind of the ceiling and floors, medical condition information. You kind of get these players uh, essentially like fully scouted. I mean, it says 50%, but you get a lot here um, that's going to work. You can also sort your scouting and, and kind of your preference scouting based on statistics before you get into this phase you can start sorting by um you know uh, statistical rankings and things like that and, and i do look at those i certainly look at these combine results too or these team workout results but understand like this is like a you know a game or two sample and so any player can get hot any player can get cold these are nice to see but they don't always tell you everything you need to know uh, so again, it, there's a lot of things to take into consideration, but this is an area, especially if you've had, you're going to come into this with zero scouting. You really want to take your time and bring in some players that you see as potential uh, fits and also kind of in that particular draft slot where they may be available. So definitely take your time with that. So next up is the protected players area. And it's worth saying too, I know a lot of people when they think expansion, they always wanna grab one of the expansion teams. It's really fun too, to add expansion in your league where you're not one of those teams. And here's an area where it can get really fun because you have to go through and, and decide the protections for your team, right? And so if you wanted to see, you're gonna get a pretty accurate picture of like what players are being protected, but it may look like some players are available, but like for instance, they may just be actual free agents. And so like they don't need to be protected. Um, so it, it's really not the, the most accurate list here, but that's what's happening in this phase. Teams are protecting their eight players. Um, anyone else would be available in the expansion draft, which is where we're heading next. Okay, so this is a sped up recording here of the full expansion draft. I get 14 picks. Of course, Las Vegas does too. And it's a snake draft, meaning they get the first pick and then I'll pick two and three and then they'll go four and five and so on. And there's a lot of different strategies you can take here. I mean, you could fill out essentially a full roster of 14 players, um, but also you'd be filling out your salary cap potentially too. So you need to be careful about that. You could intentionally even pick players that have team options or even player options and, and maybe they end up uh, you know, declining those and it kind of frees up some space. But for me, I was a little bit fearful of coming out of this with not much. And so I really wanted to make sure we got some players who can compete. Uh, and you can see there, I made my first pick as Isaiah Stewart. Uh, by the way, the first pick was Clint Capella to Vegas. And so um, from there, I mean, I'm really trying to prioritize getting starters. I really liked Bamba, uh, which was somebody I was looking at possibly even picking first, um, but there was a little bit more depth at center. Um, RJ Hampton's another guy I like, but you have to be really careful because once you pick a player from a team, so like Bamba and Hampton are both with Orlando, that's it. Those players are gone. All the Orlando players are off the board. And this is kind of what I'm deciding here with the second pick is I really like both these players. I probably liked uh, Hampton even a little bit more, but again, there was more depth at uh, the center, I'm sorry, the point guard position. There were other point guards that I liked. And so I end up taking Bamba here with the second pick. Um, but we're even looking at players like Kyle Lowry who makes like 30 million, but it's just for one year. He's a player that could at least help. He's, he's a really good, you know, kind of a team leader kind of guy. He's a veteran presence who can help on offense and, and things like this. And uh, again, I'm even looking at him uh, because he's pretty pricey, but maybe we can try to move him. If not, again, he kind of fills a role here for this first year. And, and certainly I don't want to go into the season not having a, a strong point guard anywhere. So, um, and again, when we say strong, it's, it's worth a grain of salt here. There aren't too many, you know, top-notch players here. But Isaiah Joe is a guy I really liked. KCP another player I really liked. 
Um, and again, there was quite a few shooting guards who I, I saw here that were all kind of like, okay, guys who can shoot the three. KCP kind of stood out to me because he can also play defense. But I was trying to strategize down the draft board a little bit of saying, okay, like, well, what can't I afford to pass on right now? Even if I like this player more, I can't guarantee uh, that, you know, with two picks back to back by Vegas that they won't take him or even take another player from the teams that another player is on that I like because, again, they would come off the board at this point. And so it, it's really tricky, but it's also not terribly complicated, if that makes any sense. You just kind of let the board come to you. It gets easier as you go because there's less players to kind of scrutinize and, and to, to look through. So um, I do end up taking KCP. Um, we are eventually going to be grabbing uh, I'm trying to, Grayson Allen. We do get later on. So again, these are players that I'm examining, but we kind of strategize and we're able to grab them later on. And uh, we ended up building a pretty decent team here overall. Again, this isn't a team that's probably even going to sniff the playoffs or anything. Um, but coming out of the expansion draft, there are some pieces. There's some pieces maybe we can move. KCP is still a valuable piece. This contract is not terrible or anything like that. Um, of course, we're also looking at things like potential. Uh, and, and there's not a lot of it. I mean, of course, the team's not going to want to uh, leave exposed a player with a ton of potential, a young player uh, or something like that. But we were able to find some players who could really fit. Peyton Pritchard's a guy we end up grabbing. Um, again, he's not he's not the uh, next LeBron James or anything like this when we talk about potential. Uh, but at 25, I mean, he's a serviceable guy. Um, gives us a little bit of depth there at the point guard position. Um, and so, again, uh, uh Wright's another player we were looking at but ended up passing on. I don't think he got picked. His contract was a little bit big to kind of be like a third option at point guard because um, I was just going to try to decide between these guys later on, but I didn't want to get stuck with that contract. And so um, I was surprised at how much of the salary cap I used up. Um, going into free agency, you know, we're going to have about like 10 or $12 million. It's not a lot. Um, speaking of salary cap, Duncan Robinson, another player I passed on because of that contract there. Um, pretty darn high. And so I, I really prioritized getting guys who can start, or at least if we were able to replace them as starters in free agency or even the draft with the number five pick, guys that would still be really nice uh, backup. So I was really kind of focused on building depth across the board, all five positions. I didn't want to come out of this expansion draft with like a massive hole somewhere that had to be addressed because I didn't want to pigeonhole myself into uh, picking someone with that fifth pick. I wanted to pick who I felt was the best available player left over. And so um, as we went through the draft, that was kind of the priority. And then as we got further down, that's when we started maybe just, you know, taking some guys that I would consider like dice rolls, um, maybe guys that could develop into something, maybe not. Um, I do believe we take Malachi Flynn in this draft as well. And so, um, you know, and there were a few players that uh, I was hoping would fall, but uh, they would get picked up by Vegas or, again, a teammate of the player I liked would get picked up and they would be removed there from the, the draft board. So um, Lamar Stevens, I can't remember. We know we were looking pretty closely at him. And I'll, I'll show you the roster here after this is finished going. But, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different strategies you can get. You could get really aggressive in one particular area. Um, you could say, like, I refuse to take any big contracts at all. We're going to come out of here with a, just a terrible assortment of players that I'm either going to get rid of or, or cut their options. And, and in hindsight, I kind of wish I almost did that a little bit more because I would have had more for, um, you know, again, free agency and, and try to build there. I mean, building through the expansion draft isn't really a successful uh, recipe or, or game plan, I guess, right? I mean, you're getting other teams kind of fodder, just players that they're willing to leave unprotected. I did use the eight player protection default. You can increase that to make it more challenging or you could lower it. Um, and there you're seeing kind of a, a list of the players uh, that we're able to grab as well as uh, players for the hustlers there. Um, and again, into uh, round 11 now. So as we get down to the end of this, it's it's pretty much just looking for project players. Again, 20 year old players. We did grab uh, grab is it a Simon Simonovic from uh, the Bulls. I think he was our last pick. I think we also took Lamar Stevens. And so um, again, just kind of grabbing some younger players. Jaden Hardy is a player we grabbed um, who actually had been using in practice a little bit. He's actually pretty good. Um, and so, uh, yeah, JT Thor, we ended up grabbing him. He's got a great name. 
And so a lot of just players like that to kind of round up the draft. But yeah, it was it was fun. I took my time. The whole thing, I, it probably took me close to an hour to really go through this. And I really took my time. I tried to scrutinize it. And again, I think in hindsight, maybe I would have um, not worried so much about trying to build a, a quote unquote competitive roster, but instead maybe just mitigate the damage of uh, taking on some of those bigger contracts. But nonetheless, they're all short term. I'm pretty happy with what we were able to do here. We at least have a competitive team and we're ready for the draft now. And that takes us to the draft. And so the first few picks were pretty predictable. Pistons with the first pick, they do go Wembayama out of France, no surprise there. Second pick, Washington Wizards take Scoot Henderson. Third pick is the Orlando Magic, and they take one of the uh, they take Oscar Thompson, one of the Thompson twins there. And then finally the fourth pick, the last pick before we're gonna be on the clock, Cameron Whitmore out of Villanova goes to the Rockets. And so that left us really with two players that I was looking at, and I did some scouting well before the draft here. Uh, as we talked a little bit about, it really, you're, you're a little bit limited in what you can see here because the draft class, I mean, you just don't have a ton of information being an expansion team, which isn't super realistic. I'll talk more about that in a second, but it's really, there, there's two players I'm looking at here. I'm in Thompson and Brandon Miller. I'm in Thompson, six foot seven point guard, really, really liked him a lot. From what I can see at 50% scouted, he's the player I kind of felt was the better pick. The only thing that I wasn't just jumping up and down with was one, all of the, the kind of the draft analysis, NBA.com, Draft Express, and so on, had Brandon Miller higher. Brandon Miller also, from what we could see, had a higher potential rating, which as an expansion team, Picking number five was vitally important to me. And that's going to be the deciding factor. Even though I really liked Amen Thompson a lot, I think he could be a really fun and exciting player to build around. It just made more sense. I wanted to make sure that we were just getting the best available player. And I had too much evidence telling me that Brandon Miller was that guy. And so that's what we're going to do here. We pick Brandon Miller number five. We're going to speed up the next few picks here a little bit more. Um, but you can see uh, right there, Las Vegas uh, ends up getting Thompson. So that'll be interesting to see that rivalry. Max Lewis, who I like, goes next. Uh, but I wanted to talk a little bit more, um, again, just kind of about the way that the draft is set up in 2K as an expansion team. It, it could use a little bit of work in regards to scouting. Truthfully, I think the scouting is too easy in this game. But as an expansion team, it's almost too difficult because they're making the assumption that you've hired your scouting staff like a month or whatever it is before the draft and so you have 50 percent like the most you can get scouting from just bringing these players in on private workouts and that's just not realistic i mean truthfully i kind of wish they would cap all scouting around 50 percent, or at least give you a slider for that i think that could be really cool because a lot of times i go into the draft and it's like at 100 percent. but what's nice about 2k is even 100 percent scouting isn't 100 percent accurate every time there's a lot of fluctuation but I felt it was a little unrealistic to go in with so little information because even someone like you watching this video, you can pull up video on these players. You can watch them in real life. You would know more than 50%, certainly if you're working on an NBA scouting staff. And so I felt that was a little underwhelming there. Uh, but nevertheless, I did like the challenge. And like I said, it would be kind of cool if they let you uh, maybe make that a little bit more flexible, which you could also monitor yourself a little bit um, uh, just by kind of going through. And we're going to speed this up a little bit here. But uh, just by kind of going through and maybe hiring less uh, scouts and things like that, you can make it a little more challenging. So anyway, we're coming up on our second round pick there, number uh, number 37 overall. And similarly, we're really looking at best available player. I'm just gonna turn down um, trades. I'll be honest, this is actually a re-recording of the draft because the draft I actually saved, I forgot to record the video for it. So um, I will be showing you, I've, I've picked the same players, but you're going to see some of the AI teams have picked maybe a little bit different players. And certainly on this list, there's a little bit of different um, uh, players available here. Uh, but a lot of the guys I was looking at were kind of these stashed players, um, and, and they're still here. Uh, and, and there's another player that just kind of ended up falling, and he fell even in this kind of redo uh, draft for this video, uh, started to fall. And that's Rajon Rupert. And he ended up falling uh, to a point where he was like by far the best available player. And because my scouting was limited, we just said, you know what? Everyone else is saying this guy's the best available. He could have actually been like a late first. Um, and, and let's just go with him. So uh, we do end up picking him. Uh, six foot seven, 42 inch vertical, it said there. And then we can just kind of rip through the rest of the second round in case anyone's curious to see it. Uh, but overall, I think the draft's really well done in 2K. I mean, I have some minor little critiques that I've mentioned, but overall, it's good. It's way better than Madden. It's way better than MLB The Show's draft. 
Um, I will give some props to NHL's draft because that's pretty good too, but overall, it's a really, really fun experience. So it's time to head into free agency, and this is an area where I would really recommend taking your time with, especially when we're talking about a, uh, an expansion team. And you can make the argument, well, what does it really matter? We're not gonna be competitive, and that's true. But you also are at a really huge advantage that you don't have any like just terrible contracts you have to worry about. Um, you're, you're kind of like uh, just at this stage one of building a team. And so, um, you know, we're talking about building a team, not rebuilding anything here. And so um, use that to your advantage. And so, um, you know, looking at players uh, who are going to be, um, you know, you don't always have to always find long term fits. I mean, the team you're building now is not going to be very competitive and, and these players you're signing might not even be around uh, by the time they're competitive. So look outside the box a little bit. You don't always have to go after the youngest, um, most high potential players. I mean, that's nice, but they're gonna cost you. And, and probably more importantly is don't be afraid to look after some of these older players uh, that can help develop your players, like a Brandon Miller we just saw there. And so um, that's kind of one of the areas I'll be looking at is I'm not afraid, especially because of some of the coaching staff that we hired who are pretty good with older veterans, I'm not gonna be afraid of signing um, older players or in Jonathan Isaac's case here, players who have been are, are injured and, and hurt. We can roll the dice on someone like uh, Jonathan Isaac. Um, pretty similar to almost how um, like my Detroit Tigers did. Uh, back in say like 2005, 2006, they end up getting uh, Magli or Donias, go to a World Series. They rolled the dice on a really bad injury with him and it worked out. One of the other priorities I'm looking at that you've seen on the screen here is Fred Van Fleet. Uh, he's a guy that we are going to make an offer to. Um, I kind of see him as he's 29, so he's not young, but he's not old. Um, he's a guy that we could certainly use, and we're going to try and see if we can get him away from Toronto. I'm also looking at players like Reggie Bullock here uh, because I think he could be a really, really nice mentor to Brandon Miller, um, a guy who can shoot, a guy who can play some defense, pretty athletic. Um, so you're going to see me kind of bouncing around there, but really kind of this in this moratorium phase, we're focused on Fred Van Fleet, a potential mentor for Brandon Miller, and then maybe a guy like Jonathan Isaac who we can roll the dice on. And if he's just injured for a couple of years on this contract, who cares? We're trying to build anyway, because if he pans out, now we got a pretty good player who's still pretty young that we can either use or we can trade. And so we're in a perfect position to take some risks like this, which I think is smart. And so again, as I'm just kind of flipping through here, I'm spending a lot of time in this moratorium phase just looking at players. Even a guy like Mike Connolly, uh, who's 37, but he is a much cheaper option than Kyle Lowry is and kind of a similar player. So he would free up a lot of money. Uh, I've looked around and Kyle Lowry has some interest from, from teams. So we could move him um, even just for like a draft pick or something like this could be useful. Um, so again, I'm bouncing between a lot of players like Reggie Bullock here. We're going to be looking at, um, I think later, Eric Gordon is another player I'm kind of looking at potentially um, bringing in as a mentor. And, and really, I think just the moratorium, I kind of look at free agency in two phases. There's the moratorium phase, which, which is where you have to be a little bit aggressive. This is where the good free agents or maybe like a really important target that you're looking at is going to be signed. And so... These first three days, you do need to be a little bit aggressive. By the way, Jay Crowder, another uh, potential player as a mentor I'm looking at for Brandon Miller. And you need to be aggressive in these three days. But after this moratorium phase is done, a lot of times, I, I'm kind of wrapped up with my free agency plan. And then from there, it's, it's really focusing on being patient. And here's me looking at Brandon Miller. I'm just trying to determine, uh, gosh, what kind of a mentor would really fit him well. Um, and so again, just kind of bouncing around looking at that. Uh, but being really patient, um, you know, you're going to be able to get players after free agency for a lot cheaper. Uh, and really, the, the quicker you sign a player, the, the more premium you're paying on that player, right? It's just like any other market in real life. And so uh, just trying to be patient here. So here's us putting together an offer for Jonathan Isaac. Um, and again, don't mind rolling the dice on a guy like that. Um, he wants around like 11 and a half million or so. I think we're trying to go a little bit low and I want to say he's going to reject this here. And, and obviously you're seeing this in a sped up speed, um, just so I can kind of narrate through this because, uh, you know, it can get a little bit slow just watching me comb through free agency here. Cause like I said, I do take my time with it. Um, you're talking contracts here. You're talking, uh, spending a lot of money. And I'd also say just because you have cap room doesn't mean you need to always spend it at the end of the day, guys, an NBA team's a business. The more team you don't, the more money you don't spend on your team, 
the more income it is for that franchise. And so it, it, let's just say your, your aim is to win 50 uh, games a year, right? If you can win 50 games a year, but spend 15 million less than you needed to, that's like a double win, right? So it's, it's always trying to find that balance. You don't have to always spend everything you have. Um, this is me kind of looking at some of the cap holds we have. I'm um, kind of determining that, gosh, uh, you know, I like Horton Tucker. He's got a lot of potential, but I can let this guy kind of, uh, we don't need to really worry about his cap hold at 16 and a half million because we can price sign him for a lot less than that. That's a pretty high contract for him. Um, even though he's 22, he's got some potential, but he's got no badges or anything. So again, he's not like a, a guy who's going to completely change our franchise necessarily. Um, so again, you can see Reggie Bullock here. Um, he is going to end up signing with the Pistons, Van Fleet signs and stays with the Raptors. So we end up losing out on our first targets here in uh, day one of the moratorium. Not a huge surprise. And again, this is me just kind of going through looking at like, do I really need cap holds on some of these players? I mean, this is nice, but you know, be careful about hoarding junk, right? It's just like, uh, like you're looking to sell stuff at a garage sale or something, right? Um, we are all guilty of hoarding junk and it can happen as you're building an NBA roster. We're looking at JT Thor or uh, Julian uh, uh, Champagne. I mean, respectfully, these guys are kind of junk in NBA 2K23, right? So it's not really something we need to be... Um, you know, losing any sleepover. And if we can free up more cap room, that gives us a little bit more flexibility to offer contracts. And you can see right now our cap room's a little bit tight because of that big cap hold, uh, the 16 and a half million one that we had on Horton Turner, I think was his name. And so again, that's that's limiting us a little bit here. But this is me kind of looking at Mike Connolly as an option. Again, it'd be kind of a replacement for Kyle Lowry, a much cheaper. Lowry is around 30 million this year astronomical, ridiculous amount of money for what he's rated, which is like a, a high 70 overall, but I don't care. He has value. We have cap space. If we can move him, that's fine. Uh, I also like him because he just has a lot of badges and I think he can help our team develop. Um, so it's kind of like having a coach on the floor is how I saw Kyle Lowry, which is why we picked him. So again, he's at a 79, 78 overall or so right now. And yeah, really just looking around. I mean, there's tons of nice players the uh, in free agency obviously but you know it's just kind of uh it, it's just kind of tricky this is me here what i'm doing now is i'm trying to sort through um like attributes that would be similar for a mentor for uh, brandon miller and specifically i'm looking for perimeter d three-point shooting and that that kind of physical uh it's called which is kind of like athleticism in the player card and I'm basically looking for any players that have like a B plus or higher across the board. And then the extra part of that is I'd want them to have enough like badges to actually be able to sign him as a mentor, right? So Eric Gordon is is a guy that can fit. Not only that, he's the same position. Even though he's six foot three, he's not really what I'm looking for in a small forward. I don't care. He's basically a coach that's going to be wearing a uniform is how I see him. At a 75 overall, he probably won't really play other than some injuries, even on an expansion team. And so that's what we're looking around at. Harrison Barnes, nice player, kind of fits that mold, but he has no badges here for some reason. So um, there's not really a whole lot I can do with mentoring with him. And so that's what I'm looking for here, just kind of looking around. As far as I know, it's it's more impactful to have a player of the same position mentor uh, the position you're trying to mentor. So I'm trying to look for a small forward, preferably. Um, my guess is that maybe like secondary positions could also help. And you could have anybody mentor anyone, but it just makes sense that like a positional alignment would help. And then certainly an older player, and this is what one of the things I like about how 2K has done their um, kind of team management, the older the player is, or kind of like the bigger age gap there is, the more impact it can have. And that makes a ton of sense, right? Um, so... Looking for kind of players that are older, it's also one of the reasons why I've mentioned now why I wanted some coaching staff that were good at bringing about older players because it's kind of the best of both worlds is that we can um, you know bring in some older players who can contribute but also mentor. Uh, Jonathan Isaac has signed, as you can see here. So he is uh, a guy we're able to bring in. Super excited about that. Like I said, it's a roll of the dice, but he's he's kind of a, we have nothing to lose. Who cares? If, if he if he busts and we waste 11 million, we're going to be bad for a few years anyway, and we'll be out of that contract. So um, here I'm just being really stubborn. I'm going to just for the next, uh, really most of free agency, you're going to see me start offering uh, as we're into day three of the moratorium now, I'm going to start offering a lot of just like minimum contracts and just seeing if they eventually they bite. Um, and it's just not really happening. 
Uh, you're going to see I'm kind of doing something similar with Mike Connolly. Um, and I start looking a little bit more at point guard because, again, Kyle Lowry, we could move as much as I said I like the guy. I also previously talked about the importance of trying to cut uh, the, the impact that your salaries are having because we're trying to run a business sort of too here. The more money we have, the better we are in position for the future. And so if I can bring in even a, a uh, Mike Connolly or uh, another player we're looking at here is uh, going to be Trey Jones. Sure. I mean, that gives us some flexibility. And if not, we can roll with three point guards. I mean, I don't mind having five guards on the team uh, between the one and the two who can play. I mean, you need subs, you're going to have injuries. And so, um, you know, I'm really trying to keep as much depth as I can on this team. Like to me, if you're not like a 76, you really or 76 or higher, you don't really have a chance of um, really sniffing much playing time. And, and if you are, you're going to be in some trouble. So um, this is us making an offer to Trey Jones. And again, it just kind of just the way free agency kind of fell at this point, our top targets were gone. Um, we got Jonathan Isaac, but we missed out on Van Fleet and Reggie Bullock. And so, um, uh, and there we go. We, we were able to get Trey Jones, as you saw on that screen there. And so through the moratorium, we get a 23 year old 80 overall Trey Jones point guard. He has no badges and we get Jonathan Isaac, kind of a redemption project we talked about. And, and as we get into free agency now, what we're seeing here is simply uh, I'm looking at just for bargains, really. It's, we're just kind of bargain shopping at this point, trying to get Eric Gordon to, to sign low. Um, I start looking around for just young players, right? And so we're, we're speeding this section up pretty quickly here because it's a lot of just not really great players at this point. Um, but there's, again, me re-offering Eric Gordon over and over, trying to get him to accept that each day of free agency. Um, and you'll eventually see there's going to be a, uh, a point guard I like and a center that I end up liking here, um, which you'll see in a little bit. And again, just looking around at some former players, uh, former Pistons especially, like, well, what happened to those guys, right? Um, Dickinson, the uh, center from Michigan, uh, he is a guy that I'm going to end up looking at. And then Isaiah Stevens, he is the uh, point guard. So there's Dickinson. And again, I'm just looking to get them to sign minimum contracts. I'm like, guys, you know, what are you, you going to do? Like, no one's going to offer you a contract. Why don't you come play here, develop, see what happens? And um, I'm also looking around at those players that we had cap holds on, realizing it's pretty much pointless to keep these guys around. Let's just get rid of those cap holds, which I'll do. And you can see we're already through day nine, just ripping through free agency. There's not much I'm doing. And I said that earlier, right? I take more of an aggressive approach in the moratorium phase, but then I get very conservative with the rest of free agency because I don't need these players. I'm not going to let them dictate the finances of this. Um, this is me also looking at maybe do we bring in a third center here for a little bit of depth. There's some centers that are asking really, really low pricing uh, at this point. Uh, uh, DeMarco or DeMarcus Cousins is one. Um, even someone like Howard, uh, Dwight Howard at center. And so we're just kind of looking around to see maybe the, maybe there's a move to be made here. Uh, but also realizing it might be nice to keep a little bit of cap space for later on because after free agency, kind of at the start of the season, there's another opportunity for us to sign free agents, obviously. So that's what we're kind of looking at here. And again, different strategies. It really is just, it's its a unique situation with an expansion team. And that's uh, really something you want to think about uh, when, you're, when you're team building. It's certainly different than a, a team trying to compete. It's certainly different even than a team in kind of a traditional rebuild. So definitely be curious to hear how you approach your expansion team though, if you've uh, worked on one. So let me know. Um, maybe your approach is similar, maybe it's different, but we're getting to the end here of uh, free agency, kind of the formal free agency, still trying to get guys like Jay Crowder, maybe Dwight Howard, somebody to kind of bite. Um, I don't end up making any offers to these centers because I feel like there'll be some later on that we could just grab if and when we need it. And same thing for a like potential mentor like Jay Crowder. We can wait till after free agency. We can do the exact same thing with the younger players, the point guard Stevens and the center Dickinson. Just kind of wait and see how it looks after a formal free agency. So yeah, that's the end of free agency. Let's take a look now at the actual roster. Again, really building for depth. Um, Lowry, oldest player at 37. Um, we just kind of look at positional depth here. You can see uh, Brandon Miller, 20 year old, our, uh, not our youngest player, but certainly our, our best youngest player. And uh, a little thin in the front court there, but um, it, there's enough positional kind of flexibility that I, I'm okay. And that's another reason why I'm looking at maybe bringing in another center, but we don't really need to spend the money. If Hartenstein or uh, Bama get hurt, 
then maybe we can bring in a, a veteran center to kind of fill that void. But right now, we literally just be paying a guy to kind of sit on the bench. Um, so we don't really need it just yet. Um, I really like them. I mean, the front court, they're all like 25. You know, uh, Isaiah Stewart uh, is 22. I think Jones could really, I mean, Lowry and Jones could be a really good developmental project, which I like. Um, Pritchard's there for injuries. He can also play the two, so it gives us a little bit of flexibility. As, if we don't have a ton of depth at shooting guard, but two guys who can play. Um, and again, Brandon Miller obviously is going to develop at the three. Um, and I think there's enough, even though we're thin at small forward, there's enough positional flexibility. We have some guys who can step in and play that. Um, so I think we'll be okay there. Uh, and if not, again, we have a little bit of a, a salary cap to kind of work with. There'll certainly be some veteran players available, and uh, we should be okay. So pretty happy with how the team worked out. It's it's uh, for an expansion team. I feel like it's a decently deep team. Again, we don't have any like high top end. Uh, talent. We're not going to uh, probably even sniff the playoffs this year, but I mean, we're going to win some games and, and we should be uh, a team that can really just focus on developing and just getting better. So let's take a look real quick at player progression, um, but that's really going to do it kind of for my, my game plan here of how to set up an expansion team. Um, you kind of saw the approach that I took. Hope it was super helpful for you. Um, again, expansion uh, is, is a challenge, but there's a different, a few different routes you can take with it. So um, I hope my route helped kind of give you a vision for what you want to do. And I'm definitely curious to hear what your vision is for setting up an expansion team and how your team's going. So let me know, guys. Thanks for watching the video. Thanks for subscribing. I'm Mike Lowe, and I will see you all next time.